Hello everyone and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. It's a beautiful day here today and I'm excited to be offering you my presentation on the differences between pinned and threaded SKS barrels. Uh, if you're anything like me, when you were getting into it, you heard people referencing that in forums, maybe if you were shopping for a stock you came across it, but nobody took the time to explain it. So if you're interested in understanding what exactly is going on with pinned and threaded barrels, and if you want to see some cool uh, live fire testing of some heat testing that I did on both uh, types of SKS barrels, stay tuned because all that's coming up real soon. So the first thing that needs to be understood about the difference between pinned and threaded barrels is that we're referring to the means by which the barrel interfaces or attaches to the receiver. And that's gonna be occurring right here. Even with the rifles in the stock, we can quickly identify that this is a threaded barrel and that this is a pinned barrel, but it gets even easier when we take them out of the stock. Here we can even more easily tell that this is a threaded barrel and this is a pinned barrel. So let's talk about what exactly is going on here. Obviously, these are the barrels and these are the receivers. They're separate components, but they have to attach. So how do they attach? Well, in the case of a threaded barrel, this barrel passes through the rear side assembly. And if we look really closely in there, we can actually see right about here, that last little bit of thread where that barrel is threaded and it's being turned in to this lug, which is attached to the receiver. And that's how you're ultimately gonna get that interface, set headspace, and do all the other important things that you need to do is by turning that barrel into the receiver. When we look down here, we see that there's no lug whatsoever and there's no threads. So what's going on here, there's a slight shoulder and that's not a separate component. This is just a slightly wider diameter portion of the original barrel blank, which is heated up, it remains circular, and it's pressed right into the receiver there. Pressing it into the receiver is a lot cheaper and easier, and because you don't have to turn it, it makes it much simpler to set the ultimate headspace. The problem is, obviously, there's a potential, despite it being a very tight fit, that it could move forward or back, ultimately throwing off headspace. So the simple fix for that is driving a pin right through here. That pin keeps it from moving forward or backward, and because it's such a tight fit in there, that's gonna keep it from moving around. You'll notice this has no pin because it's not necessary, because those threads give so many points of contact and prevent it from moving laterally, not just up and down. So that's a quick down and dirty. That's gonna be the difference between the threaded and the pressed and pinned uh, barrel attachment methods. The next thing we need to understand about pressed and pinned versus threaded barrel interfaces is that when we're talking about these in terms of SKS patterns, we're talking about Chinese Type 56 carbines like these specifically. China was really the only country which demonstrated significant variance in terms of their barrel interfaces. If we were to look at some other fairly common SKS pattern variants, such as this Romanian, we'll see. The lighting's not great, there we go. We can see a long lug threaded barrel interface. We move back to this Albanian, long lug threaded barrel interface. This is Shevsk Soviet, long lug threaded barrel interface. Yugoslavian M5966A1, you guessed it, long lug threaded barrel interface. When dealing with Chinese examples, however, it's far more complicated. Here we have a long lug threaded barrel interface, just like we saw in all the other ones, but the Chinese production also shows short lug threaded barrel interface, as well as pinned, obviously. It should be noted that the legendary Triangle 26 factory, from which I derive my channel's name, never actually produced pinned barrel SKS patterns. They went from long lug to short lug and maintained short lug until the end of production in 1980. However, a great number of Chinese factories did produce pinned barrels, including dedicated military production. One somewhat minor but noteworthy difference between pressed and pinned and threaded barrel interfaces is that the stocks are not gonna be fully compatible. This little shoulder right here and right here are gonna be slightly differently positioned and their geometry is a little different because this 
threaded barrel stock needs to accommodate the shoulder in the barrel lug, whereas this pressed and pinned stock is going to have the shoulder a little farther back so it butts directly against the receiver and not the shoulder of the barrel lug because there is no barrel lug. So now we've gone over the fundamental differences between pressed and pinned and threaded Type 56 carbine barrels, but we haven't yet answered the question, which I'm guessing a lot of you have come to this video hoping that I will answer, which is, which is better or is one really better at all? If better means more valuable, then it's pretty hard to argue that threaded barrel interface Type 56 carbines are generally speaking more valuable than pressed and pinned Type 56 carbines. And the reason for that is because as an overwhelmingly reliable indicator, pressed and pinned barrels are indicative of later production, whereas threaded barrels are indicative of earlier production and earlier production examples are typically worth more. Many collectors prioritize old world machining techniques and there's a a certain amount of flair that comes with having certain machining techniques or manufacturing techniques over others. And we're talking about Chinese Type 56 carbines, yes. A 1950s or early 1960s Type 56 carbine has a different feel than a mid-1980s Type 56 carbine. And many people, myself included, would pay more because the pressed and pinned ones aren't super collectible. Now, if better is supposed to mean functionally superior, then I'm a lot less convinced that there's an argument out there that one is significantly better than the other. I'm open to being wrong, but the way I see it, there's really only two ways that make any sense where threaded or pressed and pinned could be better than the other. And for whatever it's worth, a lot of people really seem to be in the camp that threaded is always better, not just more valuable, but functionally better. And I'm not sure why that would be. So I'll talk through the two reasons that I think it could be, and then I'll talk about a little bit about why I don't think they are. So the first reason is that it's going to be marginally stronger. And I think this is absolutely true. I don't see any way that threaded barrels couldn't be marginally stronger than pressed and pinned barrels. The reason for that is there's going to be more surface area because that's just the nature of how thread engagements work of rather than two flat surfaces interfacing, if those surfaces are textured with threads, then you're just magnifying the surface area and surface area is going to create additional strength. Additionally, you're adding mass in the form of the barrel lug. And I think that mass is also going to add strength. The reason why I don't think that matters is that I've never seen a pinned barrel fail, at least in any circumstances beyond the absolute extreme. And I'm not just talking about SKSs anymore because the most popular weapon system on the planet, the AK, overwhelmingly uses pinned barrels. So we know that these work. Um, and the way I see it is that the amount of violence, the amount of force required to break a pinned barrel might be this much. And then if we add a threaded barrel, maybe it's only that much further. So the question one really needs to ask themselves is how likely is an act of this violence to be imparted onto that sheer area of your weapon? I mean, if it's violent enough, it's if it's powerful enough to break a pinned barrel, what are the chances that it's not going to be that last little bit violent enough to break a uh, threaded barrel. I'm not sure, I'm speculating here. I think the only way to test that that I'm aware of would involve actually permanently breaking rifles and I'm not gonna do that. But I can think it through and if you think it through differently or better yet, if you got some uh, SKS pattern carbines that you're willing to break, then um, I think that's the only way to get more clear. I can do better on the second one though. And the second one is I've heard the claim made a few times that one or the other will handle heat better. And to be honest with you, I don't buy it. I think that they're gonna handle heat approximately the same. However, I don't know that for sure. And I haven't ever consciously tested that and I can test that. So that's exactly how we're gonna finish out the video is with a heat test on, I'm gonna do two uh, pressed and pinned Type 56 carbines. And I'm gonna do two threaded Type 56 carbines, one long lug, one short lug. Um, 
And if you stay tuned for just a second, I will explain how that experiment is gonna work. All right, so the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna take each of the four rifles and I'll show you those four rifles in just a second, but I'm gonna take them and I'm gonna put them each through a 50 round course of fire. The course of fire will, will begin with 10 rounds of Golden Tiger. The reason I'm using Golden Tiger is I find it to be, in addition to being affordable and accessible to me, it's reasonably consistent. And that 10 rounds will be on paper at approximately 55 to 65 yards going for accuracy, but also trying to keep it realistic. Um, I'm gonna be shooting uh, at a moderate cadence as well. After those 10 rounds are on paper, I'm going to quickly load up 30 rounds of Tula, 10 round clip by 10 round clip, and just get it through the weapon as fast as possible. And that's to simulate getting uh, the weapon very hot. It's not gonna simulate heat, it will get hot. Uh, 30 rounds in 15 seconds, that's that's a lot of heat building up for the intended application of the weapon system. Um, and then I'm gonna fire another 10 round group with Golden Tiger at the exact same distance and the exact same cadence uh, as the first group and we're gonna observe differences. We're not looking for how well each rifle is zeroed. We're not looking for how well the accuracy compares to each other. All we're looking for is how did that group size change and how did the point of impact change, if at all, and seeing if we see any trends between uh, the pinned and the threaded barrels. I know this is a small sample size, I'm not trying to prove anything here, but I am trying to put out um, reasonably recreatable data points if anyone else is interested in using these data points along with their own to draw more informed conclusions. So without further ado, uh, let's get right to um, talking about those rifles. All right, so here are the four Type 56 carbines which have bravely volunteered for today's heat test. The bottom two are gonna be threaded barrel examples and the top two are gonna be pressed and pinned. Representing the threaded barrels on the bottom, we have a 1959 Triangle 26 produced carbine with a long barrel lug. And above that, we have a 1965 produced Triangle 26 Type 56 carbine that one with a short barrel lug. As for our pressed and pinned examples, that one second from the top with a light wood is going to be a triangle 416 example. That is a 1972 produced non-26 type 56 carbon. And you can see that pressed and pinned barrel there. And above it is going to be a commercial conventional 1988 produced Type 56 carbine made out of primarily scrapped military parts. All right, without talking anymore, let's go to the range, get these shots done. I'm not gonna show you every shot taken, but I'll just give you a glimpse of what the process actually looked like. It's getting hot.
All right, so that range day was a whole lot of fun, but let's go ahead and look at the targets. So you can see that for the sake of presentation here, I have gone ahead and reproduced the targets using blue and red Sharpie. Blue on the left is going to be the cold shots and red on the right is going to be the hot shots. And then also I have put a green X in the target to represent approximately the mathematical center of the group. The other thing I decided to do is for the sake of presenting the results, I only measured the best seven of 10 shots on every target. Those last three shots are still represented on paper. So if you wanna pause and see where those got, that shouldn't be a problem. The outlier shots are going to be just the outline of the bullet impact, whereas the seven that I'm measuring are gonna be solid and filled in. You can pretty clearly see that in this picture, I hope. The reason I did that is to account for a little bit of human error, a little bit of wind. That being said, um, all of the shots are on paper. So if you see a more meaningful way to interpret this, um, and you can derive the distance calculations and MOA based on my numbers, then uh, you can do whatever you want with that data, obviously. Looking at the results, at least the way I've chosen to present them, however, we can see that we do have the targets for the 1959 threaded barrel long lugged type 56 carbine. On the left, we can see that at the seven out of 10 group was about four and a quarter MOA straight out of the gate. And then when we got that barrel hot, we were looking at about 3.5 MOA. So we did have a slight shrinking in group size, both the 7 out of 10 and the 10 out of 10 group size. Nothing substantial. We did have a 1.4 MOA shift, um, a little bit up and a little bit left. But frankly, I'm not concerned about that. It could be evidence of minor stringing, but I don't think it interferes with the application of the weapon system. Um, and I'm not even convinced that that is actually mathematically significant. Looking now at the 1965 short lug threaded barrel type 56 carbine, we can see that the cold bore group came out at about 3.2 MOA at a 7 out of 10, and those three outliers are pretty darn close in there. When we look at the 7 out of 10 on the hot bore, we do see that it did open up just a little bit, but it's still tight. When we include the outliers, we possibly see some evidence of vertical stringing. I'm not convinced again um, at this distance with iron sights that could be me holding a little high or holding a little low. At the end of the day, we do see the bulk of those shots hitting in basically the same area with a negligible point of impact shift. So moving on to the pressed and pinned barrel examples now, starting with the 1972, we see its cold bore group, even with the preferential 7 out of 10 grouping, is pretty darn bad. It's actually at 5 MOA, or just uh, quite nearly there. But when we got the barrel hot, it really kind of dialed in and actually put out the best group of the day at 2.8 MOA, give or take. It should be noted with that 2.0 MOA group on the right, you do see that the 9th and 10th shot are holding very low of the rest of that group. Um, if we were including those, it would really open the group up. So do with that what you will. There's a chance I pulled them, there's a chance those are flyers, um, and there's a chance that the heat in some way contributed to that. Although honestly, when I look at these targets side by side, it seems like the heat only served to increase the accuracy or repeatability of this weapon rather than having any detrimental effects. It should also be noted that the point of impact shift is very comparable to what we saw in the 1959 long lug. There's, technically speaking, a little bit of point of impact shift, although I'm not convinced that it is actually uh, due to heat so much as it's just uh, a mathematical artifact. Moving on to the second pressed and pinned example, the 1988 commercial conventional carbine, we do see a relatively similar phenomenon as the other pressed and pinned rifle in the sense that that first group that we're looking at is really not very impressive. The 7 out of 10 group is coming in about 4.4 MOA. And then once we get that barrel hot, it actually jumps right down to another 2.8 MOA. That one's actually slightly tighter than the other group, which I think I just said was the best group of the day. So technically, this is the best group of the day. However, we do once again see that indication of vertical flyers. This time they are two shots high, whereas previously we went two shots low. Do with that what you will. Um, I do notice on this particular sequence of targets, what I would consider to be pretty strong evidence of 
stringing. It does appear to me that these shots, as the barrel heats up, are traveling from low left to high right. We see that in the first target. And then when we look at where that point of impact ended up, once we had gotten that barrel hot, we see that the entire group moved in that direction, um, and actually quite significantly so, 3.5 MOA. So that is fairly compelling. All right, so let's go ahead and debrief those results, see what, if anything, we can learn from them. Um, I'll share what I observed. If you observe things that I missed, I would love to see those in the comments. And we'll kind of just wrap up by just trying to tie the whole conversation together and a brief summary of the realistic differentiations between pressed and pinned and threaded Type 56 carbine barrels. But back to the results. So did we prove anything? Absolutely not. I'm super happy I was able to get 200 rounds down range through four different carbines. I think that's a lot better than nothing, but it's still way, way short of being an adequate sample size to derive any type of meaningful scientific conclusion. At best, we got indicators, indicators of what might be going on and what we might look for if we were to get more data points in the future. Of those indicators, what did we see? Well, I think one of the indicators which stood out to me is that we did see consistent performance from the pressed and pinned barrels in that their group sizes shrank significantly when heat was applied. They went from around five MOA, which in my experience is pretty far on the bad end of the spectrum as far as Chinese type 56 carbines go. And then once they got hot, they dropped into around the high two MOAs, 2.8, I believe. And these rifles are capable of more. I want to acknowledge that. I know what these rifles can do when I'm shooting UM67 and when I don't drink coffee in the morning and when I got a proper rear bag set up. That's not what I was going for in this particular test. This was more of a practical type of experiment. But um, in this instance, 2.8, I will take 2.8. So that is not bad at all. Was the barrel interface specifically what was responsible for the group shrinking? I'm not positive. My gut instinct, for whatever it's worth, tells me yes. And I'm so open to being wrong about that. But my gut instinct tells me that yes, the barrel interface is having an effect on those groups uh, shrinking when heat is applied. Totally could be wrong about that. Not sure why that would be. I'm going to think about that for the next couple of weeks or something. Was the barrel interface responsible for the stringing on the 1988 commercial conventional carbine? My gut instinct tells me no. I could be wrong again, but there's a lot of things that cause stringing, and my gut instinct is with that particular rifle, we were actually seeing that stringing due to uneven uh, barrel stock contact. That's typically what I first look for with uh, stringing, and I do think that was the case with that rifle. Did we learn anything about threaded barrels? I'm not really sure that we did. Um, I think that we learned a lesson about all SKS pattern carbines, or at least Chinese type 56 carbines, which is that when you apply a realistic amount of heat, and I say realistic because I'm sure there's gonna be people in the comments of, who say you should have put 100 rounds through it, not 30 rounds through it. But I wanna remind people that the SKS is a semi-automatic rifle with a fixed 10 round magazine loaded by Mauser style stripper clips. This is not a Kalash we're talking about. This is not a stoner pattern rifle we are talking about. This is a different mode of fire, which kind of bridges the gap almost between manually operated and auto-loading. Obviously, it's an auto-loading weapon, but in terms of its application, it fits a fairly strange niche in history, which I've talked about at some length in other videos. So 30 rounds just dumped really quick I think that's a pretty realistic amount of heat to be dealing with for a weapon like that, where it's intended to be used in circumstances where shot placement matters. So with that in mind, if you buy that premise, I would argue that these rifles performed super well under a realistic amount of heat. If anything, we generally saw a positive effect with, generally speaking, little to no point of impact shift. And yes, there's some point of impact shift, and yes, there's some changes. But when we talk about the application of a Type 56 carbine, which is 0 to 300 meters, shooting at a target, which is going to be uncoincidentally about the size of this shoulder to this shoulder, then it's, it's going to do what you need it to do. And I see no reason to recommend or to endorse 
one barrel interface over another. I think it's gonna have a lot more to do with the individual characteristics of the stocking, the ammunition you're using, that particular bore, rather than the barrel interface. Could be wrong, that's my impression. My conclusion at the end of the day, if you're getting a collector's rifle, yes, there's a pretty good probability that you're gonna be more attracted to threaded barrels rather than pressed and pinned barrels. If you're looking for shooters, based on my experience, including the most recent experiences, which I tried to share with you today, I don't see a compelling reason to go one over the other. And I think that if somebody tells you that, hey, threaded barrels are so much better than pressed and pinned barrels, either they need to educate me or they're just repeating stupid stuff they've seen on the internet because there's a whole lot of really great um, pr uh, pressed and pinned barrels in the world. And I see no reason to think that Chinese Type 56 carbines are somehow an exception to that trend. So yeah, that's about it. That's my video. Um, I hope you found it helpful. I hope you found it interesting. I will use this video to announce, like anybody cares, that I do have um, plans. It might not be next week, it might not be the week after, it might not be the month after, but I do have plans to do an extensive uh, comparative accuracy test across multiple factories and multiple countries and multiple decades of production using different um, ammunition with each rifle. We're gonna be using some M67, we're gonna be using some, um, we're going to be using some just different Russian loads. We're going to just see what we can work together and see if we can actually draw any uh, conclusions or get indications about uh, relative accuracy. Because I've made some claims in the past based on my experience, but I don't have very good results to show people, and I'm hoping to change that soon. So if you're interested in that video, other SKS pattern content, or just other gun content in general, um, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel. It gets me motivated to make more videos. Uh, comment, like, all that stupid YouTube stuff. And I really do appreciate you taking the time to check this out. If you watch this all the way through, uh, cheers, thank you, and um, have a great rest of your day.